Hello? Got it. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Tuttle. I'm the CEO and founder of Expect Labs. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how some of the advances that we've seen in ASR recently are going to enable uh, a new generation of voice-driven applications over the next few years that are going to fundamentally change how we interact with computing devices. Uh, and I'm also going to show you a demonstration of a set of technologies that now make it dramatically easier for people to create very good, intelligent, voice-driven applications uh, for the first time. So, uh, as I said, I'm the CEO of Expect Labs. We are a technology company based in San Francisco, and our primary product is a developer platform called MindMeld. MindMeld is a platform that lets companies create really great voice-driven interfaces customized around their own content domain. This is a product that we launched less than a year ago. Uh, we already have about a thousand, over a thousand companies that are using it to build a wide variety of voice-driven applications. And uh, based on this traction, we just announced a large financing round, and our backers include companies like Google and Samsung and Intel, Telefonica, Liberty Global, and others. Um, the opportunity that everyone is excited about, including some folks in this room and <clears throat> certainly the people who are involved in our company, is really captured in this graph. Um, specifically, there have been breakthroughs or advances in ASR that look to solve this problem for the first time since the beginning of AI. My background is in AI research. I, um, I originally started as an academic. I used to be on the research staff at MIT as well as Bell Labs. And if you told me 10 years ago that we would have solved the speech rec problem, um, I would have thought you were crazy. As, <clears throat> and I think that's a sentiment that would be shared by a lot of other AI researchers at the time. This is, uh, in our opinion, transformative. What we've seen in the past two, two and a half years is advances in uh, accuracy and speech recognition systems of 30% or more, and that's dwarfed all the improvements that we've seen over the past two decades. This is a big deal. Most researchers agree, believe that certainly for English, spe machine speech rec will be better than humans for the first time. This is a big deal. Most people outside of this room are not aware of these breakthroughs, and this technology is poised to transform how we all interact with devices. And this doesn't come a moment too soon, because we are going to live in a world in a few years where we're surrounded by three billion different computing devices. And all these devices have really great omnidirectional microphones. Fewer than 5% have physical, physical keyboards. So in this world, if you want to continue to have rich interactions with information through your computing devices, voice becomes critical. So what does this mean? This, this means that over the next few years, you're going to start to see voice becoming a feature in many, many different applications. So users are going to start noticing that products like Siri and Google Voice Search are getting surprisingly good at understanding them, and they're going to expect that same type of convenience in every application, every device that they use. And so over the next three years, they're going to see voice appear everywhere. But this is not where it stops. Um, as this technology gets better and better, these same advances in deep learning that are solving speech rec are, are going to be applied to solve language understanding more generally. And as that happens, the world that we live in is going to look a lot more like the things that we see in science fiction movies. But this is not going to be 50 years out. This is going to be a decade or less. And in this world, for many applications, voice becomes the primary interface and touch becomes secondary. The reason this will occur is because if voice is a primary interface, anybody can walk up to a device or an application and automatically know how to use it without having to learn a new UI, without having to read a manual. You can just interact with any device or app the same way you would another human. That makes this technology far more accessible than any other type of UI that we've ever invented to date. Um, this is really exciting. I, obviously, the people at, uh, me and the people at my company think this is probably the most exciting area of computer science right now, certainly one of them, but it will be transformative. Over the next 10 years, the way that everybody builds applications, the way that developers create applications, and the way that we interact with applications will fundamentally change. And for the people in this room and for the people in Silicon Valley, that represents a huge opportunity to create a new set of tools to build all of these great new apps that we've all seen in science fiction movies. And so this represents a big challenge for developers today. Just because we've solved the ASR problem or on the, on the brink of solving the ASR problem doesn't mean it's still easy to create applications that are, do a very good job at understanding people. In fact, if you're a developer today and you want to create an application that can listen and understand to a high degree of accuracy what people are saying, you still have to solve a number of other very hard problems. Specifically, 
The first thing you have to do is you have to create this knowledge graph that captures all the concepts that matter in your domain. So if you're trying to build a very good voice-driven medical assistant, you need to capture all of the millions of concepts that matter for diagnosing diseases and treatment options. That is no small task. Once you have that knowledge graph, you then have to use that to power the features in your language models so that you can understand what a user is saying. Today, you, you generally need to have a room full of PhDs in order to get that right, and it's going to take you six months, a year, or more. Once you have a sense of what the user is trying to ask for, you then need to solve the search problem, which is you have to go out and find the exact right answer from potentially thousands or millions of potential answers, and that's a big statistical search and ranking problem that generally that expertise only lives in companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple and a handful of other companies. And then last, of course, if you want to have a really great voice experience that's intuitive for the user, generally these systems require a new type of dynamic adaptive user interface that shows users as they're talking what it understands and with every progressive word, the system gets better and better. That's very different than web or mobile development today and most front-end developers don't have expertise in this area. So today, if you're looking to build one of these applications, you're talking about investing a year, two years, and you need to have an extremely smart team of people that are going to spend a lot of time and resources on this. And this is why you don't see a whole lot of really great voice apps today, because it's still very hard. So what we're doing as a company, what other companies are doing, is trying to take all of this complex technology that sits on top of really great speech recognition and put it into easy-to-use easy services that mere mortals can use to create a really great voice app. And so our company is taking steps in this direction. The product that we have called MindMeld is just that. It's a developer platform and cloud service that's trying to make it effortless to create a really good intelligent voice UI. And so any of you can go to our website, mindmeld.com, sign up for an account, and build some small apps and see how it works to get started. But generally what our uh, customers do is they sign up for an account, and then they, they tell us where their content is. They, they either give us uh, access to a database or point us to their website. And we have these automated crawling processes that will automatically analyze their content, create models that will then power the language understanding. And then the second thing our customers do is they drop in a, our client libraries that work across all platforms. And that creates this really great dynamic voice UI that allows users to ask questions and get really good answers. Um, you know, this is an example of an application we built for uh, tablets that allows you to do really good voice-driven content discovery. This is one of many applications that we're supporting. But rather than show you a video, um, I'll show you an actual demo of the product. I'll build a simple application and show you how simple it can be to build a basic voice-driven application. And any of you can try this out um, as well on our website. All right, so, um, so what I'll do is I'll go to our uh, developer center, which is mindmeld.com. And this is where you can go and sign up for an account and read extensive documentation, get access to sample code. I will log into my existing account. And when you log in, what you see is your developer console, which is where you manage your apps. I will create a new app. And the app I'm going to create is an app that will be able to answer questions about movies. So uh, you'll be able to ask questions about <coughs> um, Hollywood movies or actors or celebrities, and it should give you uh, helpful information. So I'll call this app Movie Genius, because it'll know everything about movies. And as I mentioned before, if the content that you want to create your knowledge graph is on your own website, we have tools that make it easy to convert that website into a structured data representation that powers the language models. In particular, we have this tool called the Crawl Manager, <clears throat> which I can point to generally my own website or a site that has lots of information about movies. Um, and you can click Go, and what happens in our system, on the back end, we're spinning up a bunch of uh, what we call semantic crawler processes. And these crawlers are going to the website that I specified. They're looking for things like semantic markup tags, or any other metadata that gives an indication of the type of content on those pages. So generally, if you have a site that's already been optimized for search engine or Facebook distribution, this tool works very well. And so once this, the crawlers have an idea of the pattern of objects they're looking for, in this case movies, then the crawlers will go from page to page looking for objects that match that pattern. And every time it finds one, 
they will add it as a new node to the knowledge graph. And that's what you see on the right-hand side of this console. Each one of these objects coming in is a new structured data object, a new node to the knowledge graph that captures a unique movie object. And so without any programming, you can build up this database that contains potentially millions of unique concepts or nodes in a knowledge graph, and that becomes the foundation that you use to then build your intelligent uh, voice search interface. And so that's step number one. I'll show you step number two, which is doing the front end piece of it. So creating a really good voice front end is, uh, is a tricky task to get it right. You've all used a lot of bad voice experiences, and I'm sure you know what a bad one is. There are really good ones out there, and it requires having a really great UI. And so we've taken a lot of this heavy lifting and simplified it by creating these developer uh, SDKs that run on iOS, Android, and browsers. Uh, and it literally is simple as dropping in a few lines of code into your application to get a, a really great voice experience up and running. This, so if, for example, you want to create a, a simple browser-based app that allows, allows a user to speak and ask questions and then get really great information, you can, these are the 10 lines of code that you have to copy into your uh, web application in order to set up a really great default UI. I've dropped this code into this browser app, and I'll show you what the basic UI looks like so you can get a sense of how it works. Oops, sorry. Um, so let me run a few examples to show you the type of accuracy you can expect with this. So what's that movie where Tom Hanks gets attacked by the Somali pirates? So obviously I'm looking for Captain Phillips, and just like that it shows up in the search results. Obviously you could show just that answer if that's what your application wanted to do. The API lets you do that. But without writing a single line of code, you have a very good uh, voice-driven interface that allows you to find content from your domain with very good accuracy. Um, let me do one more example so you can get a sense of how it works. Uh, show me movies that are directed by Martin Scorsese. Uh, and just show me the ones that star Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, and what's that one where he plays the undercover cop in the Boston police force? So obviously I'm looking for The Departed. It's I can ask a few questions, it shows up immediately. Think how useful that would be if you're sitting on the couch trying to find a, a video to watch or if you're on your tablet and you don't want to type a bunch of searches. And all this was done in a matter of minutes without having to write any code. So this is something you can check out yourself. Please go to um, mindmel.com. You can play around with it for free. And if you want more information, um, we have some people that will be outside and happy to answer any questions for you. Um, and that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions now. Any questions, anything? Okay, there's one in the front. What about um, mood-based movies? So here you're saying, you know, specific keywords around the movie director, et cetera, but sometimes you might be in a mood, right? So it's raining outside, you've got your hot chocolate, you want, you know, a type of genre or a mood-based movie. How does it deal with that? So we have um, an adapter that plugs into your central nervous system and can actually read. <laughs> now, uh, so the, our system is a voice-driven content discovery platform, and so it relies on having good metadata that's available that characterizes the movies themselves. So um, there are many movie databases that talk about sort of what the genre of the movie is or what the, what the mood of the movie is, and certainly if you then express that through voice, we would be able to find movies that are you know, comedy movies or dramas or things like that, but being able to read your emotions is not something that our technology does, but I've heard some other talks. I think some other people are working on that. Anything else? Any last questions? Uh, there's a couple. I, I'm sorry. Um, who is? Okay. Yeah, in when, the front here. when you train your language model, where did you get the labels for the training? The training labels? Yeah, so the, um, so Currently, the way that we're doing that is we have uh, a set of training data that we've generated internally, largely through crowdsourcing that we use to train. But as we, as we get more and more user data, we're going to use that as the source of our training data. And there's another one in the front, and then we'll get to the one in the back. Uh, do we plan to support other languages? Uh, yes. So the question is, do we plan to support other languages? So right now, we support uh, eight languages, which are mostly Western European languages. By the end of this year, we expect to support, in addition, Korean, Japanese, Chinese. But right now, I will say in advance that 
the uh, ASR and language understanding models that have the best accuracy are generally English right now. But we expect the same improvement to happen with other languages over the next one to two years. What, uh, what possibilities there for some degree of customization? Say I had a very specialized engineer. I have an engineering app, and so I'm going to have a specialized language around that. Or if I wanted to add a mood, and it was my own database that was getting crawled, and I could add those tags in. What, what, is that, those are real possibilities here? Yeah, so the question is, what, what room is there for customization? And the, if you go to our developer documentation, you'll see that it's all... Um, it is highly customizable, not just on the front end, your ability to create your own custom UI, but the back end is really designed for you to control, manipulate, and manage your own data, as well as your own uh, ranking, so that you can create a custom app. And that really is our business model. If you want one size fits all voice interface, you can use Siri or Cortana or Google Now, but our customers generally want to create their own experience in their own app, and our, our platform is designed to be very flexible to allow that. Maybe we have time for one more question, I think. Um, is there one? Uh, is yeah, Mike? can you give us a sense of the sort of upper bound of the size of the knowledge graph or a, a, some corpus of information that you've been able to practically process? Yeah, so in terms of the size of the knowledge graph, the, the sweet spot for our technology is generally in this, the millions, hundreds of thousands to tens of millions. That's really what we size our system to cover. And that generally applies to you know, thousands of companies that have large data sets but not web-wide data sets, right? So if you want to go into the hundreds of millions or billions, you're talking about web-wide search, and that's not the area we're focused on. We're really trying to make it possible for companies that have millions of data objects or concepts to have really great, uh, accurate, natural language search around those specific content domains. Okay, I, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much.